Welcome to the UK's leading PC supplier to home users and small businesses. The group has been offering PC systems for almost 10 years and we have several hundred thousand customers who we continue to service and support. At present, we employ over 350 staff at our group headquarters, all dedicated to providing the best quality solutions and the best service possible at a competitive price. You may be watching this video before you've purchased your PC, or whilst you're awaiting delivery of your PC, or after you've received it. We advise you to watch this video in its entirety before you unpack your system. These days, PC systems are very powerful but they remain complicated for the first time user. If you don't watch this video and you don't read the user guide which accompanies the PC system, then it's highly likely that you will have difficulty running your PC. In particular, you may have difficulties getting started and have problems with sound, and CD drive, modems and printers, as these can all malfunction if they're not set up properly. Please watch the entire video first and then you can rewind or fast forward to the relevant sections. The aims of this video are to inform you about the services that are available and how best to use them. You can normally place your order directly with our sales staff. Your order will be processed and your details entered onto our computer system. Details of your payment method and delivery address are taken. And if you're ordering a system on finance, a deposit may be taken and you will be sent credit agreement forms to sign. Now please return these as soon as possible. We can't process your order any further without these. You'll be quoted an approximate delivery time. Normally, this is 10 to 14 days after cleared payment. Please do not chase delivery of your PC prior to 14 working days. Once your order is taken and payment is cleared, your system is picked, configured to your specification, software is preloaded, and the system is burnt in for many hours or even days. Final quality checking ensures that everything is in order. Now, normally, if one of the items you've ordered isn't in stock, we would wait and try to deliver the whole consignment as one shipment. However, this is not always possible, and if a peripheral item, for example a software package or a printer, is likely to take a long time, we may deliver the PC system by itself first with that item to follow. The system is sent by courier delivery to your address. If you're not in to receive the system, the courier will leave a note for you to contact them directly. Now when the system arrives, please check the number of boxes and check the boxes don't show any signs of external damage. If you've any problems relating to the delivery of your PC, please contact customer services. And how to do this is covered later on in the video. If you're not in when the couriers arrive with your new PC, they will leave a card and ring the courier's number on the card to arrange for an alternative delivery time. When your PC arrives, it will come in boxes of various shapes and sizes, depending on the type of PC, the size of the monitor, and any additional accessories that you've purchased. And typically, there will be three boxes, containing the PC itself, your monitor, and any additional accessories such as speakers, joystick, or software CDs. If you've purchased a printer, this will arrive in a separate box. Now, before unpacking, take the boxes into the room where you want your PC to be. This will save you having to carry the PC around later on. And when you unpack your PC and monitor, it's important that you flat pack the boxes and keep them safe. These can then be used later on should you need to move your PC about or return it to us for an upgrade or a repair. Once you've unpacked your PC, check that you've received all the bits and pieces you need. And again, these will vary on the type of PC solution you've purchased. But in general, you should have your system unit, a keyboard, a power cable, a mouse, a clear bag containing a coloured recovery disc, and don't worry, the purpose of this is explained later on in the video. A red sealed envelope containing your Windows 95 manual and licence agreement, a Windows 95 backup CD and a boot-up disc. Now your licence agreement contains your Windows 95 registration number, which is very important, especially when you start your PC for the first time and a blue sealed envelope containing software driver disks. These are already preloaded on your PC, so you don't need to open this envelope, just put it somewhere safe. 
Now remember, incorrect installation of these software driver disks may damage your PC settings. And finally, a clear bag containing other software disks, manuals and software licenses. Once you've unpacked your PC, next unpack your monitor. There should be your monitor and the stand for your monitor, a power cable and a user manual. Any additional hardware and software such as speakers, joysticks, software CDs will be in your accessories box. The invoice will also be sent with your PC and it's normally packed into the accessories box. However, if you don't have an accessories box, then the invoice will be in your PC box. And if any of the items are missing, don't panic. Check all the boxes. Look at the invoice. Some items may be marked to follow, which means that they weren't in stock when your PC was shipped and will follow shortly. And finally, if the missing items are not marked to follow, contact customer services. And again, we'll show you how to do this later in the video. OK, let's go over to Tim. Tim. Thanks, Steve. Before connecting your PC together, it is essential that you read the user guide and Windows 95 manual. Both of these manuals are designed to help you get off to a smooth start with your new PC and avoid doing anything that may damage your new computer. Your sound, CD, modem and printer will not work if they're not set up correctly. So please read the manuals. Once you've read the user guide and Windows 95 manual, you're ready to connect everything together and to start using your PC. Now don't worry, it's not as bad as it looks. The first thing you need to decide is where to put your PC. Choosing the right location is very important. Here are a few do's and don'ts when choosing a location. Choose a hard, flat surface, such as a desk, with plenty of room for all of the system. Ensure that the area you've chosen is well ventilated, and operate your PC at normal room temperature, between 10 degrees centigrade and 35 degrees centigrade. If you have a modem, ensure that the PC is near a telephone point. Do not place your PC in direct sunlight and do not place your PC near a radiator or any magnetic sources. And lastly, try not to operate your PC in extreme moisture or humidity. Right, now that you've chosen the location, it's time to connect your PC together. There are three main types of computer design. Desktop, mini tower, and full tower. If you have a desktop PC, it is convenient to stand the monitor on top of a desktop case. It saves space, and the monitor is usually at eye level. Oh, incidentally, don't forget to attach the stand to your monitor. If you have a mini tower, then stand the PC next to the monitor, on whichever side won't be using the mouse. With full tower cases, it's best to place the PC on the floor under the desk. Whatever type of PC you've purchased, the connections at the back will be the same and have the same functions. Right, let's connect your system together. Refer to the big getting started leaflet that is provided with your system. First, connect your keyboard. Now, connect your mouse to the port labelled COM1. Next, connect your monitor. Now, if you have a sound card, connect your speakers to the sound card. Now connect your power cable from the back of the monitor to the wall socket, or if you have a power fly lead, connect it from the back of your monitor to your PC. Finally, connect your power cable from your PC to the wall socket. Ensure that when you connect your PC together that all the connections are firm. Also, never connect anything to your PC while it's switched on, as this may damage components within the PC. Your PC is now connected together and ready for action. But wait! Before you switch on, you need to familiarise yourself with the switches and LED lights on the front of your PC. Depending on what type of PC you have purchased, the switches and LED lights will be in different positions. 
but they all have the same sort of functions. Obviously, you'll have an on-off switch. You can also have a reset switch, which is used to reboot, i.e. restart your PC, without you having to switch the PC off and then back on again. There is a green LED light, which indicates that your PC is switched on. It's marked with a symbol of a light bulb. There is also a red LED light, which flashes to indicate hard disk activity. This is marked with a symbol of a drum. Depending on the PC you purchased, you may also have a key lock, in which case you will have also been supplied with some keys. The key lock is used to lock your keyboard so that it can't be used while you're away from your PC. Great idea. In order to use your PC, you will need to communicate with it by giving it instructions and manipulating it to carry out operations. This is done using the keyboard and the mouse. You will also need to load programs and software onto your PC, and for this purpose, you will use the floppy drive and CD-ROM drive. Let's look at each of these more closely, but just before we do, it will be a good time to mention the difference between hardware and software. Hardware is what we've been putting together. It's what you can see and touch, the PC itself, the monitor, the printer, the keyboard, and the mouse. But by itself, the hardware can do absolutely nothing. It needs a set of instructions, a program, to tell it what to do. And that's all software is, a set of instructions. Software is stored on disks, floppy disks, hard disks, and CDs too. But it's important not to confuse the disk with the software itself. The disk is just a storage area for the instructions. When you run a piece of software, it is copied from the disk into the computer's memory and then the instructions are carried out from there. Now there are thousands and thousands of pieces of software available for the PC, so you needn't ever worry about running out. The keyboard is an essential part of the PC. It looks a bit like a typewriter keyboard, but it has a lot more keys. You can see the familiar typewriter keyboard layout in the middle here. This here is the return or enter key. When you type in a command, you press the return key to send it to the computer. Now, there are two shift keys, a tab key, and a caps lock key, which works just like the keys on a typewriter. The F keys across the top are function keys, which software programs use as a quick way of accessing special functions, such as printing a document or saving a file. The function of these keys will vary with programs in use. The alt, alternate, and CTRL, control, keys are used in conjunction with other keys to perform different functions. For example, Control and C may be used to copy a block of text. Alt and F may be used to bring up a file menu. The latest keyboards have special Windows 95 keys which have specific functions for use with Windows 95. For a more comprehensive guide to your keyboard, refer to Chapter 2 in your user guide. Now, let's take a look at the mouse. This little fellow is largely responsible for popularizing PCs by making them easy to use. Instead of typing commands into the computer, you can use the mouse to point to items on the screen. Movements of the mouse correspond with movements of the mouse pointer on the screen. Most mice have two buttons. A few have three, but you only need two for the vast majority of programs. The left button is used for most operations. The right here is for special functions, for example, to call up a special menu. There are one or two basic movements you have to master, but it's, it's not difficult. If you can move the mouse around on a flat surface, you'll see the pointer on the screen move. And if you point to an item and click the left mouse, the item is selected. If you double click the item, it is activated. If you place the pointer on an item and hold down the left button and move the mouse, you can drag the item across the screen. And by letting go of the left button, you can drop the item. This can be used, for example, for moving or copying files between folders. Again, for a more comprehensive guide to using the mouse, refer to chapter two of your user guide. 
This is the floppy disk drive, and this is a floppy disk. These are also used to store programs and data, like the hard disk, but they have a much, much smaller capacity. Floppy disks can be used to store your data and to load software onto your hard disk. There are two main sizes of floppy in use, double density and high density. A high density disk has a capacity of 1.44 megabytes, and a double density disk can store around half that. Now you can always tell if a disk is high density or not by this hole in the top here. If the computer can see through this part of the disk, it knows there's a high density disk in the drive. Now there's another hole on the other side, on both types of disks, and a slider. This is the Write Protect tab. If you slide it so you can see through the hole, the computer cannot write data to the disk. Before you install a piece of software, make sure that the Write Protect tab is open to protect the data on the disk. When inserting a floppy disk into your drive, always make sure that the labelled side is furthest away from the eject button. Now it's important that you look after your floppy disks. After using them, put them away safely in a disk box. Also, keep your floppy disks away from magnetic sources, such as speakers. If you've purchased a CD-ROM drive, it will look similar to this. Usually, they have a tray which slides out where you put the CD. Now, there are many types of CD-ROM drive available, ranging from double speed to 10 speed. CD-ROM drives all have similar features on the front panel. You will certainly have an eject button, and maybe also a play and stop button, which allows you to play audio CDs from the front of the drive. There's also a busy light, which flashes when the drive is reading a CD. Some CD-ROM drives will also have an audio connector for plugging in headphones or speakers, as well as a volume control. When you insert the CD uh, into the drive, make sure that the printed side is on the top, because it's the underside of the CD that the computer reads. The major difference between CDs and hard disks is you can't write to a CD. You can't save programs or data to it. CDs, therefore, are a read-only medium. A CD can store around 600 megabytes of data, which enables software developers to create gigantic programs containing massive amounts of text and graphical information. Encyclopedias on CD, for example, including images as well as text, and sounds and moving pictures too. Until it broke up and fell into the river below. When you receive your PC and switch it on for the first time, you'll be faced with the Welcome to Windows setup screen. Now there's no need to panic. The main installation of Windows 95 has been completed back at the factory, as well as the configuration for all of your multimedia drivers and software. This post-install setup is just so you, the end user, can finalize the Windows 95 settings, such as your name, registration of Windows 95, printer, etc. The first screen of this setup tells you how to use the post-install setup and how it is split up into three sections. These are gathering information, configuring your computer, and finally, restarting your computer. To move on to the next page, simply move your mouse pointer over the button named Next and click your left mouse button. The next page of the setup program will be Regional Settings. Choose a setting which best matches your needs. For the majority of users, this will be English or British. To select a regional setting, move the mouse pointer over one of the options listed and click once using the left mouse button. This will highlight the selected option with a blue bar. Move on to the next page, which is called Keyboard Layout. Your PC is supplied with a UK keyboard, so pick British, unless you have a different keyboard, of course. On to the next page. This page is the license for Windows 95. This is a legal agreement explaining the terms and conditions under which you are allowed to use Windows 95. The agreement is reproduced on the inside front cover of your Introducing Microsoft Windows 95 manual. Click on I accept the agreement when you have read and understood the Microsoft agreement and then click on Next. Unfortunately, there's no alternative. The Certificate of Authenticity. In the box provided, enter the number displayed on the front cover 
of your certificate after the word product ID. There's a picture here on the screen to help you. Now Windows 95 will automatically perform the configuring your PC section. This process could take from a few seconds to a few minutes. You need to be patient. A little warning, do not turn off the computer at this stage. This may cause software corruption. Now the PC will need to be restarted. Move the pointer over the restart button and click. Windows 95 is now applying the information you've just supplied. Once the PC restarts, you can set up a printer. Look for the printer's manufacturer in the left window and then find the exact model in the right. If your printer is not listed here or if you do not have a printer, you can safely cancel this section. You can see chapter 8 in the user guide if your printer is not listed or if you install a printer at a later date. Once you've installed a printer or cancelled the printer, you'll move on to the section called Time Zone. Here you have a map of the world. Move the mouse pointer over England and click with the left mouse button. The map will rotate, putting England in the centre of the windows, and a green line will represent your time zone. Across the top you have tabs. One is labelled Time and Date. Click this tab and check to see if the time and date is set correctly. When you've set the time, date and time zone, you'll be prompted with one of the most important Windows 95 utilities. It's the Microsoft Windows 95 Create System Disks. This screen gives you the option to create a startup disk and a backup set of Windows 95 installing disks. It is strongly recommended that you create these disks as soon as possible, if not at this point. If you later have a problem with Windows 95, our technical support team may be able to rectify the problem over the phone, but only if you made these disks. If your PC comes with the Windows 95 backup CD, you do not need to make the backup disks. That now completes the post-install setup. Your Windows 95 PC is complete. After the post-install setup, you must shut down and restart your computer. The way to perform a shutdown is to move the mouse pointer over the Start button and click on the button once. This will bring up the main Windows 95 taskbar. Move the pointer up to Shutdown and click once. The background will fade slightly and a box will appear in the middle of the screen, giving you three or more options. Let's just say you've got three. Click on Restart Computer, then click on OK. The PC will now restart automatically. In Windows 95, you must perform a shutdown every time you switch off your computer. This is very, very important. Windows 95 will not save any changes to your computer unless you shut down properly. When you shut down, any data is written to the hard disk drive. After getting your PC configured and set up with all of your personal details, it will be a great time to create a recovery diskette. So, what's a recovery diskette, I hear you ask? Well, the recovery diskette is the brightly coloured disk that you received in your system box. It came in a bag looking a bit like this. Read the instructions on the screen and insert the coloured disk into the floppy disk drive and type Y. The process may take a few minutes, so you need to be patient. Firstly, the disk is formatted, and then files are copied onto the disk. Once the copy process has ended, then label the disk with this label. The diskette is now called the Original Recovery Diskette. So when do I use the Recovery Diskette? The Recovery Diskette is to be used only when your computer has problems booting up, or if you have problems because of alterations in system files that could affect sound, CD drive, modems, etc. Once you've finished personalising your copy of Windows 95 and made your valuable recovery diskette, it is recommended that you take backup copies of your preloaded software packages. If you've purchased a backup CD, this step may not be necessary. If you've not purchased a backup CD, then you need to create the individual disks. Disk Master Pro will allow you to create the install disks for all of your preloaded software applications. To use it, click on Start, then move to Programs, and a menu will appear. Move onto the menu and click on Disk Master Pro from the list. 
After a few seconds, the Disk Master Pro program will load. You'll see a book. Click on the cover of the book to open it and read through the general information and using Disk Master Pro. To move on to the next page of the book, just click on the bottom right-hand corner of the page. And to move back, click on the bottom left-hand corner of the page. To create a disk, click on a disk icon and follow the simple instructions. Once you've created all of the disks on one page, a new icon will appear in the bottom left-hand corner of the page. This will allow you to delete the image files that are no longer needed and also free up valuable space. We certainly recommend that from time to time you back up your data, for example documents or worksheets, by copying these onto floppy disks. Well, the first thing to do is panic. Well, no, don't panic. The chances are the cause is something really simple. Many problems with a PC can often be solved quickly and easily just by knowing the correct thing to do. If your PC won't turn on, make sure all the plugs are snug in their sockets. It's quite easy for the power cable to work loose from the back of the PC or monitor. Make sure that the main socket you're using is also switched on and working. Check that both the system unit and the monitor are switched on, as each normally has its own switch. You'll know if power is reaching your PC because the power light will light when you switch it on. The monitor also has a power on light as well. If either of these lights don't show, check the fuse in the plug and check the mains lead with another one. If the PC does turn on, but there is no display on your monitor, wait a minute or so. Monitors sometimes need time to warm up. If nothing happens, then check the brightness controls on your monitor. They may be turned down. Finally, check that the monitor cable is plugged into your PC properly. If it is, then remove it and check that the pins on the connector to show that they have not been accidentally bent. If the PC just beeps when you turn it on, this is because when you turn your PC on, it carries out a self-check known as POST, P-O-S-T, Power On Self-Test. If the post finds an error, it communicates this as a message on the screen or as audible beeps. Things to check for are that your keyboard is connected, there is nothing resting on it. Also check to make sure that your monitor cable is connected to the back of the PC. If your PC continues to beep, then it's likely to be an internal fault. These are covered later in the video. If you get an error message when you turn your PC on, this means that post, the power on self-test, has found something wrong with your system. You need to refer to chapter 11 of the user guide for a definition of the possible errors and what action you can take. If you start your PC and get a message saying non-system disk or disk error, check that there is no floppy disk in your drive A. We will cover other problems that may prevent your PC from working later on in the video, together with how to get technical help as well. Chapter 11 in your user guide also covers this as well. It's important that you do read the troubleshooting section in the manual and use the recovery disk if necessary before contacting our technical support for help. The manual also lists support numbers for manufacturers of ferrules and printers, some of whom provide support on their own products. There are two support services available hardware support and software assistance service. If your problem is relating to hardware malfunction, then contact hardware support on the number shown towards the back of your user guide. Please do not contact hardware support for minor inquiries, which could probably be resolved by simply reading the manual. When you call, it's likely that your call will be answered by an automatic operator who will direct your call to the service or staff you require. If the service or member of staff you require is busy, then the automatic operator will put your call in a queuing system. If your call is too far down the queue, call back later. Remember, when you call, always take down the first name of the agent you spoke to. Please don't fax or write in with a list of problems. In order to correctly identify the problem, the support staff need to ask you simple questions. The highest priority is given to incoming support calls. Support staff will not be able to reply to written questions or faxes, as invariably this is unlikely to be successful in resolving the problem. 
over 90% of the calls coming into hardware support are related to the software setup. Typically, the software setup gets altered accidentally or during installation of other programs, resulting in malfunction of sound, CD, modem or other software. Most of these problems can be resolved though by the correct use of the recovery disk. Hardware support will be able to resolve the vast majority of problems on the first call. However, you may be asked to try a procedure and ring again. If your problem is related to a fault which requires return of your unit to the service center, you'll be issued with an RMA number and asked to prepare the base unit or the entire system for collection. We'll cover this process later on. Please note that there is no free software training or software support provided with your PC. Rather than increasing the price of the PC for everyone, this service is there for those who wish to use it on a pay-as-you-use basis. The software assistance service is a premium rate service. When you call, if all the staff are busy, there is a queuing system which allows you to hang on until a support person becomes available. Whilst you're hanging on, you will hear a ringing tone, which means you're queuing prior to connection and are not paying for any telephone charges while waiting. During busy periods, you may have to wait for several minutes. If you don't get through, please try later. Now remember, when you call, always take down the first name of the agent you spoke to. Examples of problems you may wish to contact the software assistance service are help on the preloaded software, installing drivers, resolving compatibility issues, configuring the software for hardware such as printers, modems or multimedia, or difficulties in installing other software, connecting your PC to a network, etc. Return of goods for service. Over to Steve. There are three types of repair services available. DOA, which is the product reported faulty within the first 14 days, warranty repair and extended warranty repair. If you think there's a hardware fault, the procedure with all these is to contact hardware support first. The support staff will try to resolve the problems over the phone. Now, if this isn't possible, they'll ask you to prepare the goods for return to the service centre and issue you with an RMA number, which is the returns authorisation number. Please use the original packaging, which you should have kept safe. Use the computer system return form, indicating the nature of your problem, and write the RMA numbers on the RMA number stickers which were provided with your system. Stick these onto the box or boxes, but don't write directly on the boxes. If faults are reported within the first 14 days, or you've purchased extended warranty, then support staff will arrange the collection at no cost to you. If your system develops a fault after 14 days, but within the one-year standard warranty period, your system will still be repaired free of charge, but you're responsible for getting the system to the repair centre. In these cases, the hardware support staff can also arrange to collect the system, but there will be a carriage charge. Now, normally, the system will be collected by the courier and returned to the service centre. The service centre staff will log the system, check its contents and its specification, and pass the system to a dedicated engineer who will try to resolve the problems. It's an unfortunate statistic that the majority of product return for repair is not found to have a hardware fault, but instead a software setup error, which results in malfunctioning of the hardware. If a component is faulty, it's normally replaced, and service staff aim to turn around systems within seven days, but it can take longer during busy periods. Lead times will be given to you when you're issued with an RMA number and priority is given to systems which are within the 14-day DOA period or those with an extended warranty. Customer services will deal with your non-technical general inquiries such as missing items from the delivery, wrong or delayed dispatch, or delays in processing your service repair, refunds and any other issue which isn't sales or technical. When you call customer services, it's likely that your call will be answered by an automatic operator who will direct your call to the service or staff you require. If the service or member of staff you require is busy, then the automatic operator will put your call in a queuing system. If your call is too far down the queue, call back later. And remember, always take down the first name of the agent you spoke to. We do offer an upgrade service where your PC base unit will be collected, upgraded and returned. And details are available from the upgrade sales number which may be shown at the back of your manual.
When you start Windows, the large area you see is called the desktop. You can customise the desktop by adding shortcuts to your favourite programmes, documents and printers, and by changing its look to fit your mood and personality. To adjust settings such as desktop colour and background, use your right mouse button to click anywhere on the desktop, and then click Properties. At the bottom of your screen is the taskbar. It contains the start button, which you can use to quickly start a program or to find a file. It's also the fastest way to get Windows online help. When you open a program, document or window, a button appears on the taskbar. You can use this button to quickly switch between the different windows you have open. Your documents and programs are stored in folders, which you can see in My Computer and Windows Explorer. In previous versions of Windows, folders were called directories. Now you can use My Computer to quickly and easily see everything on your computer. Double click the My Computer icon on the desktop to browse through your files or your folders. In Windows Explorer, you can see both the hierarchy of folders on your computer and all the files and folders in each selected folder. This is especially useful for copying and moving files. Now, you can open the folder that contains the file you want to move or copy and then drag it to the folder you want to put it in. To find Windows Explorer, click the Start button and then point to Programs. There are two icons that look like first aid bags. One is called Make Recovery Diskette and the other is the help file for the program. This program will create you a new recovery diskette. Now, why would you need to do this? Well, if you were to use your original recovery diskette, your Windows 95 PC will lose any of your personal settings because the disk was made straight after post-install setup and before you could change any of the Windows 95 settings to suit your needs. So, if you install new software and change your PC settings, make a new recovery diskette. You can use the right mouse button to click any item and see a shortcut menu. This menu contains common commands that you can use on the item you clicked. For example, by clicking a file with your right mouse button, you can choose to open, copy, or delete it. You can also close, minimize, and maximize buttons. Every window has an X, or close button, in the upper right corner that you can click to close the window and quit the program. The minimize and maximize buttons also have a new look. To start a program, one, click the start button and then point to programs. Two, if the program you want is not on the menu, point to the folder that contains the program. Three, click the program. After you start a program, a button appears on the taskbar. To switch from one running program to another, click its taskbar button. If the program you want to start doesn't appear on the program's menu or one of its submenus, point to Find on the Start menu and then click Files or Folders. And use the Find dialog box to locate the program file. There are two different ways in which to start an install or setup program. The first is to click on Start and then click on Run. When the box appears, enter in the path of the program you wish to run. For example, A colon backslash setup. The other is, well, you could say the Windows 95 way. Insert either the first floppy disk or CD-ROM into the drive and click on Start. Now click on Settings. In a few seconds, the control panel will open. And in the control panel, double-click on Add Remove Programs. Now click on Install. Windows 95 will look for an install program on the floppy drive and the CD, or the CD drive. And when it finds the install program, it will prompt you and you can install the program or exit. Microsoft have made Windows 95 compatible with DOS applications. But how do you get past the Windows graphical user interface and into an environment that looks and feels like DOS? Well, it's easy. Windows 95 made DOS look like an application you can access 
the DOS session by clicking on Start. Programs, and then click on MS-DOS Prompt. And that's it. You're in DOS. Well, it feels like DOS and looks like DOS. Actually, what the techies call a virtual DOS machine, a VDM for short. So it's not real DOS, but it's very compatible. If you require a full-screen DOS session, press the Alt plus Enter key. This will work in reverse. From here, you can run most of the DOS applications if an application requires more memory to run. Shut down and restart the computer in MS-DOS mode. To close the DOS session, either type exit at the prompt and press enter, or click on the X in the top right-hand corner of the DOS box. If you're in MS-DOS mode, you can type exit and return back to Windows. For programs such as DOS games, it's probably safest to run them in MS-DOS mode. The only advice I'm going to offer you about games is how to play them in MS-DOS mode. If a game crashes or locks you out, you don't want it to affect your Windows 95 system. A lot of DOS games require a different configuration of memory to run than Windows 95. For this, the game's documentation will tell you how to create a boot disk with a special configuration of memory. Unfortunately, the memory configuration depends on the game. Whatever you do, do not edit the boot files on your hard disk. Always make a boot disk. These three types of file are in effect the same. They've just been given different names. I'm going to refer to them as system files. System files are very important when Windows 95 is being loaded. You usually see a nice Windows 95 logo with a flashing bar across the bottom. Now, from time to time, you will switch into the background and see lots of text and instructions automatically being executed. These are your system files at work. Without these files, your PC is dead in the sense that you can't use it. It will not work without your system files. System files include autoexec bat, config sys, win ini, system ini, and a very important Windows registry. Quite often, when your sound, CD-ROM, or modem stop working, it's because these files have been altered. We certainly recommend that you do not install any other operating system. I'm afraid our support staff will not be able to provide support for any other operating system. Your PC system may be supplied with bundled software applications. Only some of the software may be pre-installed, and the rest may have arrived on one or more CDs and may need to be installed before it can be used. Now, if I don't mention a software application, it probably comes on CD. Bearing this in mind, the following is a list of applications that may be pre-installed on your Windows 95 PC. Lotus 123 version 5 is comprehensive spreadsheet. Lotus Word Pro 96 is a revolutionary new word processor. Lotus Approach 96, a very powerful database. Lotus SmartFix FlipArt, copy and paste pictures into your work. Lotus Organizer is the electronic personal organizer. Lotus Freelance Graphics 96 is a visual presentation system. This is on certain PCs. Lotus ScreenCam Multimedia Recorder. Now this records mouse movements any number of things for training purposes. This is also on certain PCs as well. Lotus Smart Suite is a powerful tool that organizes your work and desktop clutter, again, on certain PCs. GSP Pressworks is a desktop publisher with page pilots for instant designs. GSP DesignWorks Art and Graphics Suite is easy to use and also has page pilots. GSP Money is a very useful computerized personal finance package. Keep track of your spending and your money. GSP HomeWise organizes your house and keeps track of all those household items. Pacielli 2000 Business Accounts, a fully featured accounting software package. There is a comprehensive tutorial on Pacielli 2000 in the user guide. And also we have shareware games, Doom, Raptor, Blakestone, and, of course, Pinball. Most of your pre-installed software is accessible from the Start button in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. For example, to load Lotus 123, the spreadsheet program, you would click on the Start button and then move the pointer to Programs. 
A sub-menu will appear, move the pointer to Lotus Applications or Lotus Smart Suite 96. And then finally click on Lotus 123 Release 5. In a few seconds, your Lotus 123 spreadsheet will be started. The rest of your pre-installed software can be started in exactly the same way. For more details on the pre-installed software, please refer to your user guide. Lotus have engineered their applications so they contain similarities in use, such as printing and finding help. The applications have been specifically written in this way so the user can use all of the Lotus software with the minimum of training. Basically, if you learn how to use Lotus Work Pro, Lotus 123 will be no problem at all. In the same way, Lotus have provided a utility called Lotus Dock Online. These are the actual Lotus application manuals in electronic media. However, if you need the printed manual, you can print out the electronic guides. Now, with some software, you may receive a license agreement. With others, you may not. But don't worry, the applications have either been pre-installed or are on one of our CDs. Under many agreements with the software publisher, your invoice is both proof of purchase and limited license to use the software. Now, I've very briefly gone over some of the preloaded applications. For a more in-depth explanation, please refer to your user guide. In a previous part of this video, I've talked about the backup CD and the Windows 95 CD. These CDs are to be purchased as optional extras, so they may not arrive with your PC. The backup CD contains the installable versions of your preloaded applications. There's no need to create your install disks. By using Disk Master Pro, you can simply delete the Disk Pro folder by using Windows Explorer. Using a right click, and then delete this will save you time and also free up valuable disk space. But only delete the folder if you have the backup CD. The Windows backup CD comes with a disk. This disk is only to be used when you need to reload Windows 95 onto your PC. To use the Windows 95 CD, insert the floppy disk into its drive. The PC will start up from the floppy drive and present you with a menu from which you can select your CD-ROM drive and then the Windows 95 CD takes over. Simple. The aim of the CDs is to save you lots of disks and time when it comes to reloading Windows 95 or applications onto your PC. Installing Windows 95 off a CD-ROM could take about 30 minutes. But installing off floppy disk, well, let's just say it takes longer. Installing Lotus Smart Suite's 42 disks. Ouch! <laughs> Most of you will know what a virus is, but do you know how to deal with a virus if it got onto your PC or floppy disks? Firstly, to kill your virus, you must understand your virus. Most viruses are transmitted in the same way. They attach themselves to files, and once you view, copy, or read the infected files, your clean floppy disk or hard disk gets infected. Now, because they move around so quickly, they're difficult to trace back to the original source. So. How do you keep your PC and disks virus-free? Well, you may be thinking it's easy, just go out and buy some antivirus software. Well, you're half right. Once you've purchased your antivirus software, you must check every single disk that's inserted into your PC, and also check your PC's hard disk every day. The other point is not to take things for granted. If you ever get files off the internet, friends, or even cover CDs from magazines, scan them for viruses. A virus is a program which causes damage to your files. In the same way, installing badly written 16-bit programs on a 32-bit operating system can also cause loads of problems. Windows 95 is relatively new compared to DOS and Windows 3.1. And because of this, a lot of programs that you receive with magazines with cover CDs have been written for Windows 3.1 and DOS. Be aware that the software is not guaranteed to run and be compatible with your PC, no matter what people say. So you install at your own risk. It's something you're going to have to face. Your computer system may crash and give a software error. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. Let's put it this way. If you don't get any software errors or crashes, you're probably not using your PC to its maximum capability. Now, if you've used Windows in the past, you'll be familiar with world-famous General Protection Fault, 
called GPF for short. When you run an application and get a general protection fault, you exit Windows, restart Windows, run the same application again, and everything's fine. Let me explain. A general protection fault can happen because of a million different things. Well, the official line is, a general protection fault is caused when the program tries to write into a memory allocation that is reserved for another program. So when you restart Windows and load the same programs, the chances of it occurring again are very slim. Windows is in control of the memory. If you get a lot of general protection faults, it's possible that your Windows operating system has developed a fault. So the best thing for you is to reinstall Windows and your applications. Many of the 32-bit applications and multimedia games will simply not run on the computers that were selling two to three years ago. Likewise, this PC will run most current software, but it's not guaranteed to run all current or future software. If you purchased a multimedia PC, then your computer will have a CD-ROM drive, sound card, speakers, possibly a microphone and joystick. So, what can you do with all this hardware? The CD-ROM drive will be fitted, and is at the front of the PC here. There's a button to open and close the tray. When you insert CDs into the CD-ROM drive, ensure that the printed surface is facing upwards and is placed in the centre of the tray. The most common way of CDs getting damaged is scratching. If the bottom shiny surface of the CD gets scratched, there's a chance that CD-ROM's laser will not be able to read the CD. Your sound card is at the centre of the multimedia system. It's also been fitted back at the factory, so all you have to do is use it. Well, how do you use your sound card? Well, you don't. The sound card is actually automatically set by Windows 95. Games and other applications, all you need to do is to make sure you select that sound card in your game settings. Your joystick plugs into the back of your PC. It's only really used when you're playing games such as Doom. As standard, most game settings are for the keyboard, so you may have to change the settings of Doom and any other games manually. To do this, open up a DOS session, change into the Doom folder by typing CD backslash Doom. Once in the Doom folder, type Setup, and this will bring up the Setup program. Some games have the Setup program in the game itself, such as Blakestone. Now, speakers. These always confuse me. The thing to remember is they link together. One cable goes into the sound card, usually the top hole. This is usually connected to the right speaker. And then from the right speaker, you have a cable that goes to the left speaker. And that's basically it. To use the volume control that's on the speaker, you must have some power going into them. This is either supplied by batteries or a power adapter, which plugs into one of the speakers. These are not normally supplied with the speakers. In the same way, the microphone also plugs into the back of the sound card, like this. Windows 95 has built-in multimedia support. It comes with CD player, media player, sound recorder, and volume control. I'll quickly run through each one of these utilities. They're not difficult to use, and Windows 95 has endless help regarding these programs. You can use CD player to play audio compact discs from a CD-ROM drive connected to your computer. This means you can listen to your favourite music at the same time as you work on your favourite spreadsheet. The media player can be used to play video clips, MIDI and wave sound files, and many other sound or visual files. The sound recorder, well, for this you must have a microphone plugged into the back of your sound card. You can record sounds such as your voice or your dog barking and then play it straight back. Well, the volume control, well, does exactly what it does. It controls the volume. Now then, you're probably wondering, this is all great, but how do I access these programs? Well, Windows 95 makes everything easy. You simply click on Start, and then Programs, Accessories, and finally, Multimedia. And there they are. Simply click on the one you want. If you have problems with any of the Windows multimedia applications, the best thing for you to do is to reinstall this may sound like a big job, but it's rather quick and easy to do. For this, you must enter the control panel, double-click on Add Remove Programs, click on Windows Setup, 
Here you have lots of Windows applications and utilities listed. It's from here you have to remove and reinstall sections of Windows 95. Move down the list until you come to Multimedia. Next to it has a box with a tick in it. Remove the tick by clicking on the box with your left mouse button. You're now removing the multimedia applications of your PC. Click on OK and then close. Now restart your PC and do exactly the same, but this time highlight the multimedia sections and click on Details. Put a tick next to each one of the programs listed and click OK. Your PC will again need to be restarted so the changes can take effect. Performing this simple operation of removing and then reinstalling applications fixes most software problems related to multimedia. A modem is a device which lets your computer talk to another computer down a telephone line. With the correct software, you can send faxes, surf the net, and connect to information systems such as bulletin boards or BBSs. The modem is what makes the super information highway possible. By giving you access to outside sources of information, the world is literally at your fingertips. So, what's the internet? The internet is short for the International Network. It's a global connection of thousands of computers all linked to each other. You use your modem to dial into one computer, and from there you can branch out and contact the others. You can download or transfer software from a remote computer to your own and access information on virtually any topic you can think of. You can also communicate with other users all over the world. There are two main types of modems available, internal and external. Internal modems are fitted inside your PC, and you can see them when you look at the rear of your PC. You attach one end of your modem cable to the connector marked line, and the other end to your telephone socket. External modems are separate boxes which connect to the port at the rear of your PC marked COM2 and need their own power supply. The external modem is connected to your COM2 port using this special cable. You also need to connect your modem cable from the modem connector marked line to your telephone socket. Now there's quite a bit of jargon attached to modems. Modems are described by the speed at which they operate. The faster the modem, the more data they can transfer in a given time. Currently, transferring computer information over the telephone line is quite slow, so you really ought to buy the fastest modem you can afford. The standard modem is rated at 14400 BPS, a measure of its data transfer rate, but the faster ones operate at 28800 BPS. The shorter you're connected or online, the lower your phone bill will be, so you'll save money in the long term if you use the internet a lot. Internal modems are fitted and configured before you receive your PC and are therefore ready to use when you turn your PC on. External modems are supplied separately with your PC and need to be configured before they can be used. We'll now cover setting up both internal and external modems because it has been known for customers to accidentally remove their internal modem settings. Firstly, let's go through how to set up an external modem in Windows 95. Click the Start button and select the Settings menu. Then select Control Panel. And now double click on the Modems icon. Now click on the Next button and Windows 95 will try and detect your modem for you. It's recommended that you let Windows 95 detect your modem. If it doesn't recognize your modem, this screen is displayed. Click on the Next button, and Windows 95 will give you a list of modems to select from. Now select the modem you have and click on the Next button. Either way, Windows 95 will ask you to select a communication port for your modem to use. For external modems, use COM2, because your modem is connected to this port on your PC. Windows 95 then shows you this screen, telling you that you have successfully set up your modem. Click on the Finish button. Now Windows 95 shows you the Modem Properties screen. Click on the Diagnostics tab and then select COM2. Now click on the More Info button. This displays this information. 
This is information that Windows 95 has gained about your modem by communicating with it. This means that your external modem is working and ready for use. Now you can set up your internal modem. Click the Start button and select the Settings menu. Now select Control Panel and then double click on the Modems icon. Next click on the Next button and Windows 95 will try and detect your modem for you. It's certainly recommended that you let Windows 95 detect your modem for you. If Windows 95 does not recognize your modem, this screen will then be displayed. Click on the Next button and Windows 95 will give you a list of modems to select from. Select the modem you have and click on the Next button. Either way, Windows 95 will ask you to select a communication port for your modem to use. For internal modems, use COM4. Windows 95 then shows you this screen telling you if it successfully set up your modem. Click on the Finish button. Now Windows 95 shows you the Modem Properties screen. Click on the Diagnostics tab and then select COM4. Now let's click on the More Info button. This displays the following screen. And this is information that Windows 95 has gained about your modem by communicating with it. This means your tunnel modem is working and ready for use. Before we go on, a point to remember. If you have a problem with your modem, 50% of the time it's not your PC or modem that's at fault, but the modem at the other end of the line to which you're trying to connect. Remember, it takes two to tango. If there's a fax modem in your PC, you'll notice an application opens up every time you start Windows 95. This is the Windows Inbox. In order for you to send or receive faxes, Microsoft Inbox needs to be open. Back at the factory, most of the configuring for the Inbox has been done for you. All you need to do is to change the telephone number. To change the settings of the Inbox, you must have it open. Click on the taskbar to switch to the Inbox, or if you've closed it, double-click on the icon located on the desktop, here. Click on Tools, and move the pointer down to where it says Microsoft Fax Options and a sub-menu will appear. Move into the sub-menu and click on Options. From here, the option box appears. Click on the tab across the top labelled User. From here, you can change your personal settings on the Microsoft Inbox. Sending a fax in Windows 95 is very easy. Firstly, you need the Inbox open. and Then move the pointer to Compose at the top and click. A pull-down menu will appear. On the menu, there are a few options. One is New Message, the other, New Fax. The New Message option is for mail messages. This is only ever used on a Windows 95 network. Click on the New Fax option. After a few seconds, the Compose a New Fax wizard appears. The first screen is if you're using a portable computer. So you could tick this box and the screen will not appear next time. Then click on Next. Here, fill in the relevant details. Once you've filled in all of the blanks, click on Next. This screen asks if you wish to send a cover page. And if you do, which one? Let's select Urgent and now click Next. Fill in your fax message here and once you've done so, click on Next. If you wish to attach a file to your fax, select the file at this point by clicking on Add File. Then click on Next, and now click on Finish, and your fax will be sent. Imagine a small network of computers talking to another network of computers, 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 and so on and so on for a very long time. That's basically what the Internet is, a very, 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 very big, huge, massive network of computers, and I'm not kidding. Well. This all sounds great, but how do you actually get on and become part of the Internet? Well, there are endless Internet providers you can use, such as CompuServe, Pipex Dial, America Online. The list is endless. Basically, your Internet provider gives you a service. They let you have an Internet address so people can send you mail. And they also let you have a data storage space on their file server, so your hard disk doesn't get too full up. 
This is all for a set subscription fee every month. With most internet providers, they'll supply you with a disk, like CompuServe, for example. You simply install the disks onto your Windows 95 PC, and when you start the CompuServe program, it will ask you to fill out a registration form online. They will hook you up immediately, and they usually give you a free trial period, so you can test the internet and see if you like it before you pay anything. So, this is how it works. Let's say you live in London, and you ring your local internet provider. Let's say it's Pipex Dial. So remember, it's a local call to the Pipex Dial file server. The Pipex Dial file server will then ring any address you give it. For example, I could log into the Pipex Dial file server and from there tell the file server that I want to look at Microsoft. The Pipex Dial server will log in to the Microsoft server in America and then hook me up to that server. Remember, I'm only paying for a local call. This is what makes the internet what it is today. You can even email the President of the United States. It's just like sending a letter, only you get a quicker response. Because modem problems can be troublesome, we'll look at some common problems and their solutions. Problem. I can't send a fax using my modem. Solution. Make sure Inbox has been correctly set up and Microsoft Fax has been installed correctly. To install Microsoft Fax, select Settings, Control Panel, Add Remove Programs, and then select the Windows Setup tab. Now scroll down to the Microsoft Fax icon and place a tick in the box by clicking inside it once and select Apply. Microsoft Fax will now be installed. To set up Inbox, refer to Chapter 8 in your user guide for more details. Problem. I can't receive a fax on my computer. Solution. Make sure Inbox is running in the background. And if the problem persists, check to see if Inbox has been set up to receive a fax. Refer to the section on Setting up Inbox, again, Chapter 8. If you have a problem with your modem, check to make sure that the modem at the other end of the line you're trying to connect to is also working as well. There is a modem number which you can dial that has been set up to allow you to test your modem if they think it's not working. Please refer to the modem section in your user guide for more details and the number to dial. If you want to print out documents or pictures, you'll need a printer. There are three types of printer in common use. Dot matrix, inkjet and laser. Now they all offer different levels of printing quality with laser printers probably being the best. Once you've unpacked your printer, taking care to remove all sticky tape and foam paddings, you'll generally have the following. Obviously, your printer, a printer cable, if you bought one, a power cable, and your printer's instruction manuals. In addition to that, you'll have software drivers for your printer on floppy disk or maybe on CD. <laughs> Whatever type of printer you have, they all connect to your PC in much the same way. You connect your printer to your PC using the printer cable. Plug one end of the cable into the printer and the other into the port at the rear of your PC marked LPT1. The two ends of the cable are different, so there's no danger of getting it the wrong way round. In order to use a printer, a software driver is needed. This is usually supplied by the printer manufacturer on floppy disk or CD. Now, if your printer is a very popular make, the printer drive will also be present in Windows 95. Let's see how we set up a printer in Windows 95. 1. Click on the Start button and from the Settings option, select Control Panel. 2. Select the Printer icon and double-click. 3. The Add Printer Wizard will be activated. Click on the Next button. 4. From the list of printers, select the make and model of your printer and then click on the Next button. If your printer doesn't appear in the list provided, it's quite likely your manufacturer has provided a printer driver disk or CD specially designed for Windows 95. Insert the driver disk into the floppy drive and click on the Have Disk button. Now, follow the instructions which Windows provides for installing drivers from a floppy disk. 
95. If for some reason your printer drivers do not exist on the list provided by Windows 95, and your printer manufacturer has not supplied you with printer drivers for Windows 95, then you should contact your printer manufacturer. Some telephone numbers are provided of common printer manufacturers in Chapter 12 of your user guide. Once Windows recognizes your printer, you'll be prompted for the port on which to install your printer. Select LPT1 printer port and click on the Next button. 6. Windows will now prompt you to enter the name of your printer. You have an option to enter a new name or keep the one provided by Windows. Select the Yes option to make your newly installed printer the default printer for all of your Windows-based programs. 7. Select the Yes option if you'd like Windows to print a test page and then click on the Finish button. It's recommended that you select the Yes option as this will verify whether or not your printer has been set up correctly. Windows will now install your printer drivers and set up your printer. It will also print a test page if you answered yes when Windows prompted to print a test page earlier. 8. Click on yes if a test page has been printed. Your printer should now appear in the printer's window. If a test page was not printed, then select the no button and Windows will try again. If on the second attempt the test page hasn't been printed, then check that your printer is switched on and online. Also check there's at least one sheet of paper in the printer. If your printer doesn't respond, even after meeting the above conditions, try installing the printer again. If it still doesn't print, then there may be a problem. Let's discuss these now. If your printer won't print, try the obvious solutions first. Make sure it's plugged in, switched on, and the cable is firmly connected at both ends. Make sure also that the printer is online. You haven't accidentally pressed the offline button. You should also make sure it has paper and it's not jammed. If some printers run out of paper, they have to be reset before they'll start printing again. In Windows, make sure the correct printer is selected as the default printer. You'll find that Windows 95 contains a lot of information in the form of online documentation and it's very important you use this information because it could save you a lot of time. With that in mind, use the Windows Online Help to solve your printer problem. Simply click on Start, Help, Index tab, and type in Print Trouble. Click on Print Troubleshooting, and this will launch the Print Troubleshooter. This troubleshooter helps you identify and solve printer problems. Just click to answer the questions and then try the suggested steps to fix the problem. Finally, you may need to change the type of printer port you have set up. We'll see how that's done later in the video. It is well worth getting to know the inside of your PC. Some problems may occur because a component has become dislodged inside your computer, and so therefore can be easily corrected without having to return your PC to us for repair. Please remember that not all hardware available today is compatible with your PC. And we do offer a list of popular upgrade products that have been tested and also offer an in-house upgrade service which does not void your warranty. To look inside your PC, firstly, you need to remove the cover. Whatever design your PC is, desktop, mini tower or full tower, the cover is held by a number of fixing screws. But wait! Before you attempt to remove the cover, Ensure that your PC is turned off and unplugged from the mains. Now, to remove these screws, you'll need a Phillips screwdriver. It looks complicated, doesn't it? In fact, it's not that bad. All PCs have similar components. The motherboard contains the main electronics of the computer and is the part to which all the main hardware items in the PC are attached. The central processing unit, or CPU, also known as the processor, is the brain of the computer, and all of the computing work is handled by this CPU. The random access memory, or RAM, is used by the PC to store instructions and data temporarily while it's working. RAM is measured in megabytes, MB, and comes on single, inline, 72-pin memory modules, or SIMs. These are plugged onto the motherboard in pairs. Here we have the hard disk drive. This is where the PC permanently stores 
all of its software and data. The capacity of the hard disk is measured in megabytes again. The 3.5 inch floppy disk drive lets you exchange data and software between your PC and, of course, floppy disks. The CD-ROM drive is an optional device which may be fitted to your PC. It allows software to be installed and used faster than from conventional floppy disks. The power supply converts the main supply into voltage that powers the motherboard and other hardware components inside your PC. These here are the expansion slots, and these are used to plug in additional cards, such as modems, network adapters, and sound cards. And this guy here is the graphics card. This may be on an expansion card or may be integrated into the motherboard. The BIOS setup program is stored on the computer's motherboard in a ROM BIOS chip. The BIOS setup is a program that controls and configures your PC's hardware. It's a permanent record of the system configuration and is always there, even when your PC is turned off. PCs may come equipped with a BIOS from one of several software companies, depending on the system you've purchased. The information about what BIOS your computer has appears on the screen when you turn on the computer. It's also detailed in the motherboard manual supplied with your system. Now you may access the BIOS program when your PC is booting up. A message is displayed on the screen for a short while and then disappears. Depending on the type of BIOS you have, this message and method of access into the BIOS program will certainly vary. During boot up, the BIOS checks the record created with the setup program. If it discovers a problem with your system's hardware, a message will appear on the screen asking you to enter the setup program and correct the information there. Many setup options are highly technical in nature and should be changed only by knowledgeable users or service professionals. Do not reset any setup values on your PC unless you understand the consequences of the changes. The BIOS setup program is usually run when setting the date and time on your PC, setting security controls such as passwords, remember write it down and keep it safe, setting power conservation features, setting the type of parallel port you have, e.g. SPP or ECP or EPP. This is sometimes necessary if your printer won't print anything. And then setting video memory to 2 megabyte. This only applies, of course, if you have an integrated graphics motherboard using UMA and at least 16 megabytes of RAM. In the unlikely event that you lose your BIOS settings, in other words, the BIOS program forgets what configuration your BIOS was set to, then you can recover your settings by accessing your BIOS program and loading the default values. Next, auto-detect your hard drive. Finally, save and exit the BIOS program. This then restarts your PC with its original configuration. Now we'll look at some of the problems which can occur when you're using your PC and how to deal with them. We'll also look at routine maintenance of your PC and how you can keep it running smoothly. The way your PC communicates that it has a problem is via error messages. Now there are dozens of error messages. Hopefully you won't run into too many of them, but if you do, the message itself can often be quite helpful. We don't have time, unfortunately, to cover every message, just the more common ones. You can look others up in Chapter 11 of the User Guide. The most common error messages you'll come across are fatal exception errors and general protection faults, or GPFs. These occur when a serious system error occurs, usually when a piece of software or Windows itself crashes. You'll get an option to continue or to close down the offending application. You should choose to close down, quit Windows, and reboot your system. If you're in a hurry, you can restart Windows without rebooting, but you may be lining up more trouble. Sometimes, even though the option to continue is there, it has no effect. These errors occur because whilst you are using your PC, the software and hardware are competing for resources, such as memory. Sometimes the software and hardware compete for the same resource simultaneously. And if the resource is not available, an error occurs. This message most often appears when you ask the system to read a floppy disk, which is not in the drive or which is corrupt. The options are to abort, which usually stops everything and returns you to the DOS prompt, retry, which tells the system to have another go, 
if you are trying to read a corrupt disk, retrying a couple of times may just enable the system to read the data, but it may not. Fail attempts to continue the operation from the point at which it encountered the error. This generally does not work as the program needs the information which it cannot get, so continuation is pretty pointless. Now this message appears when DOS doesn't understand the command you typed in. Check that you entered the command correctly. DOS is very intolerant of typing errors, I'm afraid. It may also occur if you use a switch it doesn't understand. If you get this message when you switch on, don't panic. It probably means you've left a non-bootable floppy disk in the drive. Simply remove the disk and press any key. You're in DOS or running a DOS program and you're suddenly locked out. The mouse and keyboard don't work and the screen is frozen. This could be a hardware or a software problem. The solution, check that the keyboard and mouse are plugged in securely. If they weren't and you press them in firmly, you may still not be able to regain direct control of the computer until you reboot, but at least you know what the problem was. Now, there are certain keys which can make a program stop its current job. So try pressing the escape key, then control and C, control and Q, and control and break. If none of these work, you may have to reboot. Press Control, Alt, and Delete to perform what's called a soft reboot. This will work most of the time, but if it doesn't, your computer is well and truly locked up. Press the reset button to perform a hard reboot. Also, check the program after restarting. You may also want to run ScanDisk to check the state of the files. If a Windows program locks up, try switching to Windows itself with the Alt plus Tab, Alt plus Escape, or Control plus Escape keys. If that doesn't work, press the Control, Alt, and Delete keys to quit the program. This may produce a message asking if you want to quit the program or Windows. Now, if the program is really awkward, you won't be able to quit it, and you'll get a message suggesting you press Control, Alt, and Delete again to restart the computer. If you regain any degree of control, try saving any unsaved data and then quitting properly. In any event, if you manage to quit the application or Windows without having to reboot, you should then restart. When you purchased your PC, depending on the model you bought, you may have been provided with a diagnostics tool called PC Check. This comes on a bootable disk with a comprehensive instruction sheet. PC Check is an accurate and easy to use diagnostic tool that enables you to check the configuration and reliable operation of your PC. Designed for use by manufacturers and repairers, PC Check is a comprehensive program providing facilities to test your PC by exercising each hardware part in turn and indicating those errors that may be at fault. If you are supplied with this software, it's recommended that you run PC Check to determine if there is a genuine hardware fault on your PC before contacting our technical support department. This also allows you to give the technician on the other end of the phone accurate information about what part of your PC is giving you problems. Routine maintenance of your PC is very important and helps your PC to keep running smoothly. This mainly involves tidying up your hard disk and taking precautions to avoid viruses infecting your PC. You should routinely do the following. Firstly, use Windows 95 Defragmenter to defragment your hard drive. This basically takes the data on your hard disk and puts it in one big chunk instead of being scattered all over the hard drive. To use the defragmenter, click on Start button and then select the Programs menu. Now select the Accessories menu and then select the System Tools menu. Now double click on Disk Defragmenter. The Disk Defragmenter then asks you to select which drive you want. Next, click on the Start button. When the Disk Defragmenter has finished, click Yes to exit. Secondly, in the Windows 95 desktop, there is a recycle bin. If you delete anything, it is put in here. Therefore, you must empty it regularly. Thirdly, a virus is a small piece of code, a program which attaches itself to a file on your hard disk. And when this file is run, the virus runs too. Now, it may try to copy itself to other programs.
and it may perform any number of insidious acts. Typical virus symptoms include strange messages appearing on your monitor, strange graphics such as a bouncing ball or strange noises coming from your PC speaker. Files you know should be on your disk are missing. Your PC becomes very slow and programs which normally run perfectly suddenly crash. The more deadly viruses can destroy software or even system information. Fortunately, there are precautions you can take to protect your computer against viruses. Computer viruses don't float around in the air. Your PC can only catch a virus from an infected program, which means if you never ever load a piece of software onto your computer and never take software from strangers, your computer will be safe. But that's hardly practical. You can guard against viruses by running an antivirus program. And there are several on the market. Also, never load anything onto your PC before you've checked it for viruses. When you have any Windows 95 problems, insert the recovery diskette into the floppy drive and restart your PC. The PC will automatically start loading from the floppy drive and load the recovery diskette menu. Note that this is slower than starting up from your hard disk drive. The recovery diskette menu contains eight options. The best and most effective ways to use the recovery diskette is probably enter on option one and work your way through to option five. So, the eight options are as follows. After trying an option, you should check to see if the problem has been fixed. Once the problem has been fixed, you should not carry on trying any more options. Let's just go over this procedure just one more time. First, insert the recovery diskette in the floppy drive and switch on or restart the PC. Then, choose option from the list. First, try option one. Remove the diskette when prompted to do so and then restart your PC. Check to see if the problem's been fixed. If the problem has been fixed, then carry on using your PC as normal. Do not try any more options. If the problem hasn't been fixed, then repeat number one above and choose the next option from the menu. Now, if you make software changes to your PC, it's recommended that you run the Make Recovery Diskette. This program is on the Windows 95 screen. Along with this is a help file. Double click on the help file for more information on the recovery diskette. If your PC has a Windows 95 system problem, the first five options of the recovery diskette will probably fix it. If the problem is in our preloaded software applications, there is one more option you can try on the recovery diskette. This is option seven, restore master image. Let me explain what this option does. Imagine a copy of your software stored in one big file. This is a mirror copy of your hard disk's data and was made at the factory so the data in this file is untouched. If you were to run option 7, the first screen you will see is a warning. This warning is basically telling you that you must back up all of your personal data before running the Restore Master Image program. What happens is the program will delete all of the data and programs that were originally on the drive, including Windows 95, leaving only the Master Image Restore program and the file containing the copy of your hard disk. The program then goes to work. It replaces the original files into their original places on the hard disk. And yes, it will replace the Windows files and programs like new, creating what we call a software reload. The image restore could take up to 50 minutes, but it really depends on your PC specification. Once the image restore is complete, you'll be prompted to remove the recovery diskette and press any key. The PC will restart automatically. The Image Restore program has one final stage to perform. It will enter Windows 95 and automatically run a program that will restore all of the Windows 95 long file names. After this, you need to shut down and restart. And there you have it, a brand new software reload without the PC having to be sent back to us. I know that this option sounds a little bit drastic and you might hesitate, but it is probably the most effective way to zap your software problems and can be used time and time again. This option is only on our special selected range of PC. If you do not have the files needed to run option 7, the recovery diskette will not delete any files and tell you that the files needed are not present.
We hope you found this video useful. There are also other video products available. For example, there's a video which covers Windows 95 in more detail, and that should be available from your sales contact. If you have any suggestions on how this video could be improved, or any other feedback on our products and services, please indicate these on the pre-postage paid customer registration card, and send this card to us after a few weeks of using the new system. We value these comments, and we'll try to incorporate your suggestions into products and services. So from Tim, bye, and from me, until the next time, goodbye.